Hi there! A useful instrument in the Hobbist Lab is the Function Generator, a device that generates electric signals with different shapes, like sine, square and triangular waves, to test various circuits, such as amplifiers and filters, both in low and high frequencies. If you are one of those people that likes to build audio circuits, electronic musical instruments or even radio circuits, you will need a Function Generator for testing and tuning the devices you make. There are two main alternatives to own such a device. You can buy one, or you can build one. Yes, I know, thinking of building a lab instrument doesn't seem something easy to do, but just a little experience in soldering components and being able to read the schematics will set you on the right track with the help of this video. And you will be able to easily make a function generator good for all the applications. Watch this video till the end and see by yourself. Hi there, I am Carlo Carrano and this is Electronics Engineering Made Easy. Here is the schematic of our economic function generator. The circuit is built around the ICL8038, which is a voltage-controlled oscillator capable of providing simultaneously three different waves sine, square and triangular. If you are following the Synth project series, you will recognize that I already used this IC to try to build a VCO for the Synth. In fact, I spent an entire video to show you all the capabilities for this interesting device. I also mentioned that this device has been defined as obsolete, and so I ended up using something else for the Synth VCO. Something that is even more powerful, but costs definitely more. I'm reproposing the same IC now, even if considered obsolete, because I recently realized that it is still very well available through several vendors. They even have in stock hundreds of thousands of these components. I also discovered that this same IC is used by a number of Chinese vendors to make a function generator kit that can be bought for a few dollars on several sites, even on Amazon. These kits are also sold already assembled by the same vendors. However, I am not going to suggest you to buy any of these kits, because I found they have one main problem. They do not provide an adaptation layer for the output impedance. And because of that, I am afraid that these devices will end up providing very distorted waves once connected to an external circuitry under test. In the circuit I am presenting today, instead, I have added such impedance adapters in the form of voltage followers built around these op-amps that you see on the right of the schematic. Moreover, my circuit allows a much larger range of frequencies than those kits, and is very stable between 60Hz and 18000Hz, which is a range more than enough to test any kind of audio device you may build. Although you see four op-amps in this circuit, there are only two ICs in addition to the ICL8038. The reason is that these op-amps come in couples in the same chip. And so, these two op-amps on the left side are those contained in U1, and the two op-amps on the right side are those contained in U2. Both U1 and U2 are LM358, as listed here in the upper right corner of the drawing. Capacitors C3, C4, C5 and C6 are used to eliminate noise at the pins that powers the ICs. To achieve that, one of the two ends of each of these capacitors needs to be mounted very close to the IC pin. The triangle and sine waves, coming respectively from pin 3 and 2 of IC1, enter directly in the non-inverting input of the two op-amps on the top. The square wave, which needs a pull-up resistor connected between pin 9 of IC1 and the plus VCC, goes to the non-inverting input of this other op-amp through a voltage divider made by R12 and R13. The voltage divider reduces the amplitude of the square wave by a factor of 3. And this is necessary for two reasons. First, the output has a level much higher than those of the sine and triangular waves. The voltage divider this way makes amplitude more similar. The second reason is to obtain a better shape of the square wave. In fact, because of the rise time of the op-amps I used, it would take too much time for the square wave to reach the upper and the lower end of its values. 
and as a result, at the highest frequencies, they would not have even the time to reach the max and minimum amplitudes, and therefore the wave would become a triangular one. Instead, reducing the amplitude of the signal, the total erase time is much smaller, and even at the highest frequencies available with this circuit, the shape of the square wave will still be able to reach the max and minimum values, looking more like an actual square wave. The fourth hole pump, although available, is not used, I needed only three of them, so to avoid the noise propagating from it to the other hole pump of the same chip, I connected the two inputs together so the output will be always at a constant zero. The remaining of the circuit on the left side of the schematic is the one required for the best performance of the ICL AD38. Note that this IC is powered like your pumps with a dual voltage, however, while the negative voltage is directly applied to pin 11, the positive voltage reaches pin 6 through the diode D1. And this is done so that the positive power supply will be a little lower, just a little bit lower, than the max positive voltage used to control the frequency of the circuit and the shape of the sine wave. If you want a full explanation on that, you can refer to the datasheet of the ICL8038. Capacitor C1 is the one that provides the charge and discharge cycles for the oscillator, and is connected inside the IC with a couple of current generators, one for the charging and one for the discharging. The amount of current in such generators is controlled by the voltage on pin 8, and therefore this voltage controls the frequency of the oscillator. The voltage in pin 8 is applied through the potentiometer R9. This potentiometer is connected in series to resistors R8 on one side and R11 on the other, that define the range of voltages to obtain the desired frequency range. Capacitor C2 is used to filter out the noise on the cursor of the potentiometer to make sure that it will not cause a random modulation of the frequency. Two inputs R7 and R10 are used to adjust the shape of the sine wave, one for the up, upper crests and one for the lower crests, and we will see shortly their effect in lab. Resistors R2 and R3 control the duty cycle of the square wave. Now, if you wanted to have a variable duty cycle, you would have just to use a potentiometer of 5k instead, in series at each end with a resistor of 1k. But, since this is supposed to be an economic function generator, and since the duty cycle change capability is not something that is used every day, I decided to avoid this little complication. For what concerns the power supply, you have two options. Either use a couple of 9V batteries, which can be excluded using this 1S2 switch, which will be a 2P2T. Or, use your benchtop power supply, set to provide anything between 9 plus 9 volts and 12 plus 12 volts. Let's now move to the lab, where we will be able to see the circuit mounted on a breadboard and its performances. Here is the circuit mounted on the breadboard, which is powered up with the help of this simple device that connects a dual power supply with the positive of the red upper rail, the negative of the bottom blue rail, and the ground to the remaining two inner rails. Here is the dual power supply, providing voltages of plus and minus 12 volts. This one on the left is the ICL8038, and these are the two LM358, each one providing two op pumps. These long yellow wires are those that connect the outputs of the ICL8038 to the inputs of the op amps, which provide impedance adaptation to each of the ICL8038 outputs. Thanks to the op amps in voltage follower configuration, we can safely attach any sort of load to the function generator. These are the two twin pots used to adjust the shape of the sine wave, and here is the timing capacitor for which I choose a film capacitor which helps with the stability of the oscillator. And finally, this is the potentiometer that is used to provide a control voltage to the current generators that charge and discharge the capacitor. The circuit is now powered up, as we can see from the two LEDs on the voltage distribution board and I already connected the oscilloscope probe to the first of the three outputs, the triangular wave, which we can now see on the oscilloscope. Now, if we manipulate the potentiometer, we can change the frequency of the triangular wave. Right now, it is oscillating at about 47 Hz. 
And if we rotate the potentiometer all the way, the frequency goes up to about 18 kHz. Let's now remove the probe from this output and let's connect it to the second one, the one for the sine wave. And here it is on the oscilloscope. You can see that it is already well rounded because I have already adjusted the two inputs on the breadboard. But let me now play a little bit with them so you can see what kind of effect each one can provide on the sine wave. Moving now the first input, and you see that it is mainly altering the shape at the top of the wave, making it more or less pointy. And of course, moving the second input, we can change the shape on the bottom part of the wave. Let me put it back so we can see a nice sine wave again. And now let go all the way down with the frequency by acting again on the potentiometer. Let's adjust the oscilloscope scale. And here is our nice sine wave currently oscillating at about 53 Hz. Now let's check the last output, the square wave. Here she is on the oscilloscope and you can see how it is well shaped running currently at about 56 Hz. Let's go all the way up with the frequency and uh, let's adjust the scale of the oscilloscope. You can see how the wave has changed shape slightly because of what we previously said on the rise time. However, this wave is still very good to be used to inject signals on an audio circuit under test. And of course, you see how when I decrease the frequency, the lower I go, the better becomes the shape of the wave. If you decide to build this circuit, I suggest you to use a simple perf board and solder all the components to it. You might also decide to use a multi turn potentiometer instead of a regular one, so you will be able to better control the output frequency. Also, if you like, it shouldn't be much difficult to encase the whole thing in a nice box. For the power supply, if you want to be free to move around the device, you could use a couple of 9V batteries. Otherwise, just use the three banana plugs for the two voltages and the ground, and then power it up through your bench power supply. I'm sure that you will have a lot of fun building this circuit and using it for your experiments. And with that, I'll see you in the next video, and as usual, happy experiments!